welcome to church welcome to the house of the lord we welcome those people joining us on youtube on facebook thank you for having us in your homes um just going to pray uh, for the service say lord thank you lord thank you for the service mighty god we commit the service into your hands we just pray lord that you have your way you have your way lord in our hearts you have your way lord god in this house lord and you have your way in our homes but the God, as we come together, Lord, we just pray, mighty God, that you give us hearts that are attuned towards you, Lord. That, Lord God, we give you praise and honor, Lord, and we make it about nothing else but you, mighty God. Lord God, your weight says, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You've set your heavens, Lord, above the heavens and the earth. So, Lord God, we just thank you for your weight this morning. We just pray, Lord God, that you open our eyes, open our ears, Lord God, open our hearts, to, to, to see, Lord, to hear, mighty God, and to follow you, Lord God, wherever you lead us, Father. We just thank you for each and every one of us, mighty God. We commit our lives into your hands, Lord, and we just pray for the communion, Lord God, that as we share the Holy Communion today, Lord, that, Father God, you just open our hearts to this world, Lord, to be able to share your word, Father, to be able to pray for those who are in need. So we thank you, mighty God, and we commit our lives and this service, Lord, into your hands. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. One thing Jess has shared is that she felt that there's someone here that with that feeling, but also it's manifesting in the body with a pain in the back. And it might be someone here in the church. It might be someone at home. It might be you're in that place of loneliness, and it's actually having a physical effect on your body. That have been in that place, it's, it's binding you. And Jesus is the healer. We're not the healers. Jesus is the healer. He heals. And God today can set you free, whether in your home, whether it is. I mean, it might be you're with family members at home. You can get whoever's with you to pray for you. If, they're, if they know the Lord, just let them respond. If not, just begin to reach out where you are to Jesus, because he can be with you right now where you are. And so we are going to pray. If there are people here in the church who want to respond, then we'll allow the team to go to one side, and you can go, just come and receive Pred, distanced in that sense of not getting too close, but actually still being able to manifest and release the presence of God. We're here today as a family, as a body, as a part of a church community. And if you're at home, just begin to reach out to the Lord now, that Jesus may bring that healing into you. So we're just going to pray. And then we'll allow the team to, to move to the side. If anyone, like we say, does want to respond in the building, 
just go and, and receive if you're at home and then you want to respond later you can do so by online connecting and requesting that prayer and, and later you can be put into a prayer room with someone who'll be able to pray with you and actually lead you in prayer so that you don't miss out on what God wants to do today. God, if God is revealing this, it's because he wants to bring you into freedom. It's because right now he wants you to come out of bondage into the freedom that he has for you. He doesn't want you to finish or go home or end the service still in the same issues that, that you've got. And so right now, God is opening a door, an opportunity for you to receive from him. So let's just pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to pray now. You are not a God of who wants to bring depression or heaviness. You are a God who came to set us free from those things that would bind and hold us down. Lord, even Paul at one point, Lord, to the Corinthians, talks about feeling like he was pulled down into depression, into lowness, because such was the effect of things around him. But he also then says, thanks be to God who redeems. And Lord, we just thank you today that you are the one who can set us free from those things that assail our minds, assail our hearts, assail our bodies. The Lord, you came to release us not only to release us into newness of life but to release us from bondage and heaviness from depression from those things that would bind Lord and Lord where there is unforgiveness where hurt has been caused to such an effect that you can't let go we just pray right now Lord that you will release that forgiveness into hearts and minds that people can begin to release one another and let go of the pain and the hurts of the past the Lord Jesus, there will be that recognition that, Lord, unless they forgive, they cannot be forgiven. And, Lord, we need to, at times, just release those burdens, those chains that have been laid upon us, even from things in our childhood, even from things in our past. We loose ourselves from those chains in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I just pray that you will begin to manifest your presence into homes and lives right now, that you'll bring healing, Lord healing into homes lord where people are bound with sickness infirmity where unforgiveness has rooted itself lord just today begin to uproot that lord begin to uproot it and set them free lord that there will be healing flowing healing in your name healing in your power healing in your your majesty lord that you may be glorified because lord jesus you are the one who heals so lord we call on you now Lord, to be stretching forth your power and just be releasing blessing. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing. And we just pray for more. More, Lord, for the glory of your name, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Maybe the worship team could just lead us in a song. Could you do that, Jess? Just lead us in worship for a moment. Praise you, Lord. If you want prayer, then I'm just going to let the, the team just go to the side and pray. We're going to just carry on in our service. Like we say, if you're online and you feel you need prayer, then just message Charmaine, put a message through, and at some stage we'll manage to sort out a, a room for, for someone to join you and pray for you. And we're just going to receive. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Our God is good. As we sang, He's a good, good Father. Amen. And we sing Him in action. And we thank Him for His goodness and His love. Because He's perfect in all His ways. He's absolutely perfect in all His ways. And his timing is just perfect. And his love is perfect. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 16 to 46. 1 Kings 18, verses 16 to 46. I read in the name of Jesus. So... Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you traveler of Israel? 
I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at uh, Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Verse 25, Elijah said to the prophet of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping must be, and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their customs until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the, tribed, of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two, two seeds of seeds. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all th these things in your com at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and you are turning their heads back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell burnt up the sacrifice, the wood, 
the stones and the soil and licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the, Ki to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariots and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, and heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our God is speaking and working today. And we believe in a God who speaks and works. And a God who wants to be involved in our lives. And I just want to share a few things today from out of this passage. Firstly, I'd just like to start by apologizing to those who tried to join us online last week and had sound issues and problems. And um, We are really sorry. I hope that this week has, has been an improved situation. But last week I was speaking about Passover and how Jesus chose the Passover as the point, the moment of his death. Jesus himself chose that time, that period, and, and the, the, the aspect of Passover, which was about deliverance. You see, Jesus could have chosen the, the festival of atonement, the day of atonement, in, in which was all about dealing with sin, but Jesus chose Passover, which was about deliverance, about being set free, and about coming from death to life and being released into the things of God. And I believe Jesus is still wanting to talk to us about what it is to be free. That's the whole thing we've been looking at over the past year. Because the image Jesus chose for his own death and resurrection was about being delivered. He even spoke to the disciples before his death saying, Now is the time where the prince of darkness, the prince of this world, must be driven out. Because Jesus was wanting to bring freedom. And the challenge that we're going to face in our lives is what spiritual influence are we allowing to operate in us? And sometimes that's obvious, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we can allow influences to come upon us, and we don't recognize that they are. You see, sometimes the wrong spiritual influence can be very obvious, very clear, and at other times it can be hidden and less clear. We can think we're operating in the right spirit or what we're receiving is coming from the right spirit and yet it may not be. You see this with Jesus in his own ministry because Jesus rejects the Pharisees. Now to every external appearance, they were doing everything right. They had the law, they were keeping the law, they were going to the temple, they were offering their sacrifices. They were doing everything as far as external appearances would say that was correct. They were the ones who were keepers of the law, who were establishing that in the heart and in the minds of the people. And yet, Jesus says to them, you are not of God. 
In fact, when they tried to say that Abraham is our father, he said, no, Abraham is not your father. In fact, Jesus says to them, your father is Satan. Jesus says to these Jewish men who for all external purposes were the, the pinnacle of Judaism, that the influence you are operating under is demonic, is satanic, it is not of God. And I feel today God is wanting to just get our attention and say, what are you receiving? What is it you're satisfying your thirst? What is the well you're drinking from? Because we can have a hunger for God. We can have a hunger and a thirst for the word of the Lord. We can thirst after God. We can thirst after the prophetic word. We can thirst after God's presence. And sometimes when you thirst so desperately, you can begin to satisfy that thirst with that which is not of God. You can actually satisfy with a replacement for the truth, with something that appears to be truth, but in reality is not. The semblance of, the echo of, that which looks to be right. It might dress in the right clothes. It might sound the right voice, but it's actually not right. It falls short. And I think God is wanting to get attention of his church and his people today because he is wanting to make sure that we are drinking from the right well. That we are drinking from him and not from other things, from other sources. And the question we have to ask as we begin is, what well are you drinking from? Because it's not about just what you receive in church. What are you drinking from in your personal life, in your home life? What is it you're connecting into? What is it you're engaging with? What is it you're quenching that thirst that you have with? Because our God does speak. Our God is a God who talks. He is not silent. He wants to be known. Sometimes when preachers talk about this, they talk about the rhema word of God or the logos word of God. One they will say the logos is the written word and the rhema the inspired word. Actually, both words are interchangeable. They don't have that clear distinction between them. But the heart of what they're saying is right because God is not just a God who has revealed himself in history, but we have a God who is revealing himself today. And we can hunger and thirst after that which is from God. And as I was thinking and praying about this, there were three things that really came to, to, to heart. One is that we can sometimes in our thirst drink the sand, and I've talked about that in the past. But we're going to touch very briefly on that. We can drink sand. The second thing is we can drink salt. And the third thing is we can drink from an empty cup. And so I want to just share a little bit about what God has been just saying to me as I was thinking and praying for today. About where we can try and satisfy our thirst. And the first I'm going to talk about is that mention of drinking sand. And for those who have been around our church, you will have heard me use the analogy many times before where people who are in the desert, I'm going to still share it because there are people connecting who may not have heard. So those who are used to it are going to have to kind of put up with it. And the rest, I hope you're, you're going to in, receive what, the heart and sentiment of what I'm saying. When you're in the desert and you're on your own and you've got no water, it's said that people will walk. They will walk looking for water. They'll walk looking for the oasis. And for some, they will walk and walk. And when they don't find water, eventually, sometimes they will start to drink the sand. And it's not that they think the sand will quench their thirst. It's they, they become so delusional, their minds get lost so much that they can no longer tell the difference between sand and water. And we are living in a world that has been parched with a thirst for knowing and wanting to know the things of God. But people have begun to drink sand. And by sand, I mean where they look to other things other than the Lord. 
that they're wanting some sort of understanding of the future or what God may be saying in their lives, but they are not going to the right route. They're going to the wrong route. And we see that in our world. We see it around us. People going to other religions, other faiths, where they are wanting to build upon and say, we want to worship God, and yet they are not going to the Redeemer, the Healer, the Restorer, the one who sets them free. They are going into a false religion, a false belief in who God is. We see in those who are around us in the, the quasi sense that people will go to horoscopes wanting to know the future. Fortune tellers, palm readers, trying to look for some source, some message to connect to something that is not of God. Looking at the stars, astrology. Maybe going to different sources, different places. But actually, are not touching on the real God, on the one who can set them free. In fact, all they're really engaging with is demonic spirits who want to bring them into bondage and oppression. And when we come to this story in Kings, we find ourselves in a situation where the people have been going to the wrong source for revelation. The setting of our story that Josette's read for us is in 1 Kings is the people of Israel, the northern tribe. For those who, just to, I'll give you a, a couple of quick minutes, just quick update. The kingdom of Israel had been split into two, the promised land that had been taken over by Joshua and, and that David ruled over and Solomon ruled over had separated into two halves, a northern half and a southern half. The southern half was called Judah and contained Jerusalem and the temple that Solomon had built, the northern half was, was called Israel. And it didn't have the temple. The split happened after Solomon. Solomon had taxed the people and taken the gold. You, you read the stories of Samuel and how rich Solomon was, how wealthy he was. Well, he was wealthy because the people had nothing, because he'd taken the wealth of the people to build his palace and to build his armies and to build his home. And the so-called wisdom of Solomon wasn't that wise in some respects. And when Solomon died, the people came to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and said, Will you lift the burden that's been laid upon our shoulders? And instead of being wise, Rehoboam listened to his friends. And he said, you think my father was hard, I'm going to be harder. And so they separated. The, the kingdom split in two. And the northern kingdom had no longer access to the temple. And so they said, we will create our own place of worship. And we will worship our own God. Because the people of that day believed that the God you worshipped was the God of the land that you inhabited. And so the people in the southern kingdom of Judah were worshipping the Lord God Almighty because that was his land. While the northern kingdom was saying, this is no longer the land. We can't get to the temple. This is no longer the land of God. And so they started worshipping the Canaanite God, the God of the land who had been there before they came in. They started worshipping Baal. What they're really worshipping is a demonic entity. We're clear. Paul says that when he talks about the temples. He says the gods are nothing. They're not really gods, but they are demons. And so the people of, Is of Israel had begun to worship the God of the land. They began to worship Baal, which actually means Lord. And so the people in Israel are saying, we're worshiping the Lord. And the people in Judah are saying, we're worshiping the Lord. But they're actually talking about two different lords. And yet there were some who remained faithful. And Elijah, a man of God, a man who worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who worshipped Yahweh, the God of Judah, the God of the land, because he had taken the land 
from the Canaanites. Elijah wants to bring true worship back to the people. And so we're told he commands the rain to stop. He commands the weather. Extraordinary thing. If you were to read chapter 17, verse 1, Elijah says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Not except at the Lord's word, except at my word, he says. Such was the presence of God and the anointing on him. He recognizes that he has an authority. He commands, he says, it will not rain, and it doesn't rain. Why does he do that? Because Baal was the god of thunder and rain. So Elijah begins to evidence that actually Baal is not the god of thunder and rain. But the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, is the god who commands the weather. And Elijah goes missing. He hides. He hides because everybody knows that it's not raining because Elijah said it will not rain. And so Elijah does the, the smart thing and goes into hiding. And Ahab is looking for him. He's hunting the nations. He's hunting the tribes. He's hunting the people. He's sending to all the nations around saying, is Elijah there? Because Ahab knows that Elijah is the one who's commanded it not to rain and it's now a drought and he wants the lifting of that command. But Elijah stays away. And then at his and God's choosing, he goes to Carmel. Carmel was a mountain range in Israel. It was actually the wettest place, still apparently the wettest place in Israel. When it's dry everywhere else, it was usually wet at Carmel. And yet at this point, even there, it is Carmel. It's where the prophets of Baal had raised an altar because it was the wettest place. And Elijah goes to that place where God's altar had been torn down, where an altar to Baal had been lifted up, to the place where it should rain, but even there it's not raining. And Elijah goes to confront the people of the land about who they will serve. And he does it because he wants to bring God into the land. He wants to show them that the place that they need to feed and drink is not from false gods, but from the true God. So that is the setting. The setting is a drought. The setting is desperation. The setting is the people of Israel who depended on water. Not having water, they needed water for crops, they needed water for food, they needed water for their animals, they needed water for themselves. It's no matter how much they'd been crying out to Baal, Baal was not sending rain. Why? Because he had no power over rain, because the Lord God had stopped the rain on the earth. The rain in, in Israel was not flowing. And so... In their desperation. When Elijah calls, the people come. And that's what happens when there's a drought. When there's a drought in lives, people become desperate. When there's a drought in the world, people become desperate. When you have a drought of something in your life, you want it. When there's absence, you have need. And God has created a desperation in order to get the attention of the people. The problem is when people are desperate, they start drinking from whatever source they can find. I believe as a nation that we have been drinking the sand. It's almost that we have become so desperate in our nation that we have begun to drink from whatever well and whatever source 
we have found, even if the waters are poisoned. We've been drinking from whatever is available. I was astonished the other day by the story of Labour leader Keir Starmer who apologised for attending a church on Good Friday because he later found out that they didn't believe in gender realignment or in gay relationships. We apologised for going to that church. What sort of a nation have we become where the leaders of parties will apologize for attending a church simply because it holds to orthodox Christian faith and belief. We become a nation that will drink from whatever source is available. We've become dependent, not on the word of the Lord, but on our own abilities, our own thinking, our own understanding. One thing this year has shown is the absolute split that is there within people who have a dependence on God and those who don't because our nation has strayed so far from God that the nation is no longer calling on the Lord. That in a year and a time where there has been incredible hardship, where there has been incredible challenges, with a plague that has fallen over the land, instead of calling together and saying, let us seek the Lord, what does God say? Let us come together in prayer. Let us come before the Lord. Let us hold times of prayer. Instead, the nation and the world and the society and the press have said, what the scientists say? That has been the flow the people have followed. What does the scientific evidence say? What do the people of science say? What is their knowledge? Instead of inquiring of the Lord, it is go and inquire of man. And it's not that man doesn't have wisdom and knowledge and understanding. We know that God gives man knowledge and that man can grow in knowledge. But it shows the heart. When you instead of saying, let us seek of the Lord, we say, let us seek of man. Where actually the concept of seeking of the Lord is not even voiced or considered. Instead of going to the God who knows all, we go to Baal. We see it not just with the pandemic. We see it with the weather and the climate. We see it with everything we're doing. And so people, instead of coming to the Lord, they begin to drink the sand. They drink whatever is before them in the hope that it will quench their thirst. Well, if that is how the world is, Sometimes the church can have another problem. You see, the danger of the church today, particularly around the charismatic and Pentecostal tradition that we belong to, is the danger, is that our desperation to have influence is that we don't align with the right influence. That our hunger and desperation for the word of the Lord, that we have such a desperation to seek the Lord, we have such a desperation to hear from the Lord, that instead we allow ourselves to be quenched by that which is tainted. It's almost as if our, the thirst has stopped our taste buds. And so instead of drinking water, we start to drink the sea. What happens when people are on a lifeboat without water? They spend enough time without fresh water. The danger is they will begin to drink that which is poisonous to them. The madness comes on them. And that that which should be good becomes death. I know the scripture speaks of salt being a good thing, but we all know that too much salt can be a bad thing. Or even salt in a liquid in a small amount can kill you. 
You see, the prophetic is good. Hearing from God is good. God is a God who speaks. But not all words that are spoken are God. I was reminded of a dream that was shared with me by Cheryl over a year ago. And it was a, in a dream she'd seen the lower lounge and there were beautiful long dresses that were being cut to fit the fashion. And her word was, she just felt that sense of saying, stop. And as I was preparing, this word came back to me as I was thinking this week. Because I believe those dresses are like the prophetic. Because God has put something in the DNA of this place. He wants to release the prophetic. He's created something beautiful. But the danger is that we want to follow the fashions and the trends of those around. And so we cut that which God has given to fit that which everybody else is doing. And that we spoil that which God has intended for us because we think we are improving it because we are following the fashions of those around. We are following the fashions of what everybody else is doing. But God is trying to say, what I have given you does not need reshaping. It does not need reforming because I have given you what I have for you. And my best is what you need. And as I was thinking of that, in fact, as I was writing those words, I got a text from Charmaine yesterday. As I was putting those very words down onto paper, which was something that had come from Roger. And Roger had seen this opaque cake cover on a white table. And inside, it was opaque because what was underneath was being starved of air. And he, he said as he saw it being lifted, breath and clarity came back. And I just believe God is wanting to release today. Because every false alignment with wrong prophetic movements or everything where we try to mimic or, in, or follow other things will spoil what God has for us. God is wanting to release that which is true. You see, Elijah was a true prophet. But he was hidden. He had to hide. Not only did he hide, other prophets were also hidden. Obadiah tells of a hundred that he hid in caves. Fifty in one cave, fifty in another. In the passage in one, Elijah 18, before that little bit that was read for us by Josette. The true prophets were hidden. And so the false prophets were being listened to. And God is wanting to bring a clarity today. See, there are times where we can have a false word around us, the appearance of being right but not right. It's the danger in some movements. We've seen it recently with the prophetic movements in parts of the world, notably America with Trump, where false words have been given and people have had to rein back from those words. You see, if you've got 95% water and 5% salt, that will still kill you eventually. And sometimes we think it's wet. It tastes nice. Sometimes we think it's quenching our thirst, and it's not. The wrong word is actually drying you out. And that is the danger within any ministry, even our own. Every prophetic ministry has to have the right foundations, which is the Word of God. Any prophetic ministry has to be based on holiness, being right with God. It has to be based on being set free so that the influence we're receiving is the Holy Spirit, not any demonic influence. Because if you compromise the source of the water, you will compromise the water itself. And we need to make sure that we're hearing from God. Because not every vision is God. Paul says to the Colossians, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, worship of angels, disqualify you. 
They go into great detail about what they've seen, are puffed up with idle notions. They've lost connection, he said, with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. In other words, they've got dreams and visions, but those dreams and visions have allowed to puff them up to such an extent that they've lost touch with the root that is Christ. And it's not that dreams and visions are wrong because Paul talks of his own dreams and visions. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body, but I saw something that I can't even talk about. It was so inexpressible and glorious and God revealed something to me, but I'm not going to boast about that. I will boast about my weaknesses and about my failings and about the things that are wrong so that I stay rooted in Jesus. And God today wants to make sure that we are drawing from the right well. We need to draw from the well that is rooted in him. But instead of being prophets who speak from the wrong source, we are prophets that speak from the source of God. You see, the prophets of Baal in every way would have looked like prophets. They call themselves prophets of the Lord. A different Lord, but still prophets of the Lord. They had the appearance of. The whole bar worship had the appearance of. The worship of, of Yahweh. I don't know if you realize this, but the bar temple had an outer room and an inner room. The prophets of Baal spoke about the assembly of God and being in the assembly of God. They had the language but they were rooted in the wrong source. God is calling us today not to, to give up the prophetic, but make sure we stay rooted in the right source. It would have been easy for Elijah with all the persecution going on and the fact that he wasn't being successful. He had a small ministry in some ways. Everyone else was in the in the right. Everyone else was prophesying. Everyone else was prospering. It would have been easy for Elijah to switch sides, to go from being a prophet of God to be a prophet of Baal. I'm sure he'd have been welcomed into the camp. I'm sure he'd have been given a place of honor. But actually, Elijah knows that it's not about what situation I'm in. I mean, he becomes so desperate and so distressed and so depressed. At times he wants to run away and hide, thinking I'm on my own. They're all out to get me. They're on about killing me. God, where are you in the midst of everything? And yet God had called him to stay the course and be rooted in him. And God today is calling his church to stay rooted in him. You see, the third danger we can get into is that we can start drinking from an empty cup and telling ourselves how refreshing it is. That we can be so worried about drinking salt water or so worried about drinking sand that we don't drink anything. We become so fearful of drinking the wrong thing, we would rather drink nothing. And that is a real danger to the church. Because we don't want the salt and we don't want the sand. That instead we tell ourselves as we drink from an empty cup that this is satisfying. And this is what God has provided. And this is all God has. And so we fool ourselves into thinking our, qu our thirst is being quenched. When actually we're not receiving anything from the Lord at all. When we begin to believe in a God who doesn't speak rather than a God who does speak. Or we believe in a God who has spoken once, but now just reveals himself in his word, and that otherwise is silent. The problem is that that is not the reality of who God is. Paul heard from the Lord. Yes, he was an apostle, but he surrounded himself with others who were prophetic, who heard from the Lord. Who shared what God was saying. 
You read the book of Acts, you see prophets speaking to Paul. Paul doesn't say, this is false prophecy. He says, this is the word of the Lord. But I still know what God is calling me to do. Yes, I know I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I know everyone keeps telling me when I get there, I'm going to face persecution. Yes, I know it's the Holy Spirit. It is the prophetic word. But I also know the Holy Spirit has commanded me to go, so I've got to go. And Paul will even say to the Corinthian church, Telling them about how to discharge the prophetic ministry. In other words, he expected God to speak. The two or three prophets will hear from the Lord that God is still speaking today. And God wants us to know that he is still alive and still speaking. He doesn't want us just to know about him. He wants us to know him. He doesn't want us to just grow in knowledge. He wants us to grow in a depth of knowledge and insight into who he is. He wants us to be rooted in him. He wants us to hear his voice. But also he wants us to have that discernment to understand what is the voice of the Lord and what is not the voice of the Lord. That God's voice might be heard today. That you as you're sat in your home may not just know and understand the word, but also may have that depth of relationship. That as you are praying and interceding, you will hear God speak into your heart and into your spirit. But it be rooted in what is right and what is true and what is pure. Because our God is a God who speaks. Elijah had a relationship with God. A God who spoke to him. He didn't have a copy of the Torah in his backpack. He wasn't wandering around with a trailer full of scrolls. He didn't have the Bible. He didn't have the word of the Lord in the written form. But he had the word of the Lord speaking to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. He had God speaking into his life. And God wants to be known today. He wants to make himself known. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is not a God who is silent, but he is a God who is speaking and revealing himself. But he wants us to feast and to feed on him. Jesus went to the well in John chapter 4. And he begins to speak to the Samaritan woman. He's in the northern kingdom of Israel at that point. What would have been? To that Samaritan woman, he speaks about him being the water of life. That he would give a water that would quench thirst within her. In John 7, Jesus speaks of streams of living water flowing out of his belly. power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus today is wanting us to hear his voice. He is the water of life. That every movement of God, every prophetic movement has got to be about hearing from him. Hearing his word. The answer to the false prophets is not having no prophets, but it is learning to listen and operate rooted in Christ, hearing what Jesus is saying. Not wanting someone else's anointing or wanting to mimic how someone else walks, but to walk in the anointing and the flow of what Jesus is doing. God is calling us today to build a new altar for his presence, to rebuild the old. Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel and starts to rebuild the old altar. He's not looking to operate with a new fashion. He takes the 12 stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel and he begins to rebuild that which is God's. He is not looking to reshape it in the way that the, the prophets of Baal have shaped it. He is trying to build what belongs to the Lord. And with the stones that God had anointed, he repairs the altar. And I believe God is wanting to repair the prophetic voice in his church. He's wanting to reform the church, to bring it to a place of devotion, of holiness. Because hearing from the Lord is about walking with the Lord. 
It's got to come from a place of cleanness, about purity, about deliverance, about freedom. It's got to come from a place of devotion and commitment to the Word and being in the Word. It's got to come from a place of being in humility and recognizing that God alone is the only source that we want to operate in. Because Jesus is the one who makes himself known. Jesus is wanting to bring us today into newness of life. He wants to bring us into that understanding that he is the one who can set us free. He wants to break us free from the powers and principalities, from the bars of this world. He wants to break us free from the demonic forces and influences. He wants us to break us free from the, the false prophetic, from the false words that would be around us. We need to understand with a false prophetic that it is around us. It's interesting that it's the prophets the bar, that Elijah once called together, those who claimed to hear from the word of the Lord but were not speaking the word of the Lord. He's not calling the priests of Baal. He's calling the prophets of Baal. He's calling those who have been declaring falsehood over the land and over the nation. He's saying God is wanting to cut this off. He wants to get rid of it because there needs to be a rightness and a right standing before the Lord if we're going to walk in righteousness and holiness before the Lord. And then he begins to call upon the name of Yahweh. Our God is not a God of sand and salt, nor is he a God of an empty cup. He's a God who sends rain and waters. Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the God who we worship and adore. Jesus came to break the power of darkness. He came to bring deliverance. He came to send the Holy Spirit. He came so that we could be rooted into right influence and receive from him. He came to break the influences that had been operating over the land and over the people. He came as a true prophetic voice. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. He came to those who had the appearance of holiness, but were not holy. He came to those who called on the name of the Lord, but were not listening to the Lord. And he rejected them. And he said, I am calling today a people who will listen to my voice. My sheep hear me, and they listen to me, and they follow me. And these are the ones he was calling to. Well, our God today, our God who sends fire, also sends rain. Our God who comes in judgment also comes in anointing. And he wants us to drink from him. As I was praying about today, I'm just going to finish with those words I was praying and God said to me as I was praying and thinking about it, I was saying, God, what is it you're saying? And he said, I am still the God of Joel 2 who pours out his spirit on all people. I am still the God who says, your daughters will prophesy, your sons will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will dream, see visions. I am still, he said, on my servants, both women, men and women, wanting to pour out my spirit in these days, to show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, billows of smoke. I just felt the Lord was saying, I am still the same. I am still God. I am still the Lord. Be rooted in me. God today is wanting to build his church. And he wants to build on strong foundations. If we are going to be voices for the Lord, if we're going to allow God to speak in us and through us, we need to make sure we are rooted in Christ Jesus. 
but we are drinking pure water. Drinking of the well that is Jesus. And not allowing any other source to be influencing our lives. Elijah said, it's not going to rain until I tell you. When the prophets of Baal and Asher had been dealt with, he says to Ahab, hitch up your chariot, Ahab, because the rain's coming. And I believe God would say today, hitch up your chariots, because the rain's coming. Are you ready to receive? Make sure what you receive is the rain that I'm giving. And let me flood your life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you today. And Lord, we just want to pray that if, Lord, in, in any way we have been... Drinking from the wrong source, Lord, if we've been shaping your prophetic ministry to fit what we feel is the fashion, we just reject that today, Lord, and we repent of it. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness because, Lord, we recognize today that you are the God who gives ministries. You are the God who gives gifts. You are the God who gives gifts to your church. And Lord, we don't want to reshape anything that you have given. We don't want to change anything that you have given. We don't want to put things into a new fashion to fit everybody else. We just want what comes from you. We want, Lord, what you have for us because your ministries and your visions are always the best ministries and the best visions. And Lord, forgive us if at any time we have sought to shape things in our own direction with our own understanding or shape things according to what we feel we ought to be doing. Lord, we repent of that today. And Lord, right now, we just ask that you would give us wisdom and understanding to hear what you are saying and doing. That we will not move in the wrong flow, but in the right flow. That we will be rooted and established in you. The Lord Jesus, not just what we receive here, what we receive at home, what we receive in our own lives, that we will be rooted in you. That every part of everything we're doing will be about you. Lord, we just ask today that you will breathe your oxygen, your life into your church, that your living water may flow within us, Lord that we will drink from the well that is you. The Lord Jesus, we will drink from the well of your word. We will drink from the well of your presence. We will drink from you, Lord, that your holiness, your healing, your deliverance, your freedom will be upon us. That as we hear, Lord, we will not hear what we want to hear. We will not hear what the world wants us to hear. We will not hear what the enemy wants us to hear. But Lord Jesus, we will begin to hear what you want us to hear. But you will help us, Lord, to be so firmly rooted in you that we will flow with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I just pray today that you will help us to value that which you have given us, to treasure it, but also to show and demonstrate that you are God. Elijah's charge to the people of Israel was if the Lord is God, if Yahweh is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. But Lord, within that, he knew that you are the only true God. And Lord, help us today to demonstrate that you are the true God. That you will show your prophetic word, your truth, your life in your church. That those, Lord, who are drinking sand, those who are drinking salt, those who are drinking of empty cups may begin to see and know that there is pure, holy water in Christ Jesus. That we do not have to thirst. 
because you are the one who quenches our thirst. So, Lord, just begin to send your Holy Spirit onto the church, we pray, onto our lives, that your prophetic voice may be heard, your word in season may be heard, your word of knowledge may be heard, your word of truth may be heard, but that everything we do will be firmly rooted and grounded in you. Lord Jesus, we don't want to hear what our ears want us to hear. We don't want to hear so others may see us and say, aren't they good? Lord, that's not our heart. Because Lord Jesus, you have called us not to reveal ourselves, but to reveal you. So Lord, let your Holy Spirit come on as we pray that you may be glorified, that you may be exalted, and that people will know that you are the well of life and that you call us to worship in spirit and in truth. Lead us today, Lord, and quench our thirst for the glory of your name. Amen.